So there we go. So I'll ask one more time. What is diffraction? I'll give you 10 seconds. Go. What's diffraction? So there we go. So I'll ask one more time. What is diffraction? I'll give you 10 seconds. Go. What's diffraction? Well, doesn't look like he's answering me. Um, Bob the science guy. Do you want to ask him? Hey, Nathan. What's diffraction? And do you presuppose it? Or a shroom it? Stay in school. I highly recommend subbing to that man. Uh, link to his channel in the description. Um, Simon Dan, can you ask Nathan? Nathan, what is diffraction? No, no answer from him either. Um, fight the flat earth. Maybe you can try. Hey, Slappy the Clown, what's diffraction? <laughs> and surprise, surprise, no response to fight the flat earth either. Um, I've linked all the channels to, to those people in the description. They're all well worth a uh, sub. And I've also put the link to Simon Dan's Just Giving page in the description as well. He's running for a great cause um, at the London Marathon. And I've linked a video where he explains it all. Now, if you're watching this video, um, then you may have been sent here because of tomorrow's Conspiracy Cats video. If you're watching it today, then you might not have a clue what we're talking about. So let's just learn a little bit about diffraction. But first, I want to start off with waves. So we're all familiar with this shape. This is a transverse wave. It's the one we learn at school, and it literally looks just a little bit like a water wave. Now, before I talk about diffraction, I want to talk about what happens when two waves meet each other. And we get something called interference, which is something that only waves do. And it's fairly straightforward to start with. Um, if two waves meet each other and they appear to be synchronized, we're going to use the term in phase, but you know what I mean. If the, the crests seem lined up and the, the troughs at the bottom seem lined up, then the waves will simply add together to make an even bigger wave like this one. Now that might seem like common sense. And if two waves meet and they are exactly what we call 180 degrees out of phase or they're literally the opposite of each other, then rather than adding up, they're gonna do what we call destructive interference and they're gonna cancel each other out like this picture shows and literally will have nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean in terms of displacement, the energy is still there. Now those two are fairly easy to figure out, but this one's a little bit more tricky. You see, this one isn't perfectly synchronized or in phase, and nor is it in the exact opposite position or 180 degrees out of phase. So what will be the result of these? Now to answer that, I can't do it with my whiteboard. I need pen and paper. Okay, so this is our transverse wave. Now what we do for our transverse wave is for every single particular point on this wave, we assign it what we call a phaser. Now, a phaser is simply an arrow of a given length to represent the uh, displacement and a given direction. Why do they have a direction? Well, any particle that's at this point in the oscillation, we say it has a direction this way. Any particle that's at the top, we say it's got a direction that way. Any particle at the bottom, this way. And what we can see is that the, the given direction of this phaser moves anti-clockwise as we go through an entire oscillation. So it's 360 degrees <coughs> from peak to peak. So if I wanted to see how these two waves would interfere, and these two waves are different, they have different amplitudes, which is the height essentially, they have different wavelengths, then what I could do is I could look at what direction that phaser is at every single point across this wave and every single point across this wave, and I could add them together. Now I'm gonna do that just at this section here. So the phaser here, we said is a downward phaser. The phaser here, which is just, just off the peak, will be pointing roughly in that direction, which gives me these two arrows. Now, what this isn't is a lesson on adding vectors together, but essentially I can split these two into their X and Y components and I can get a resultant vector from that. Now, I can't do that instantaneously for every single point across this wave and the wave uh, below, but a computer can, and it can very uh, accurately predict what the, uh, what the outcome of two waves like this would be. So essentially, waves can interfere with each other, and it was this guy, Thomas Young, Hello. who was responsible for the experiment we all do at school, where we shine a laser through a little diffraction grating, and we get what we call an interference pattern that looks like this. Yeah, just a pattern of bright and dark fringes. But that interference wouldn't be possible without something called diffraction. So to put it simply, diffraction means a spreading out of a wave when it passes through a gap or around the edge of an object. Now, if we look at these two diagrams here, we can see the effect is much more um, 
obvious on the right hand side and that is because the gap is smaller. You see, if the gap is much, much bigger than the wavelength of the wave, no diffraction will occur. But if the, the gap is similar in size to the wavelength of the wave, we're going to get diffraction. And as we make the gap smaller, the amount of diffraction gets bigger. So how does Nathan Oakley try and use diffraction uh, to try and explain things disappearing from the bottom up? Well, he completely misuses a term called the Rayleigh criterion, which relies on understanding diffraction patterns. Um, so let's have a look at how a diffraction pattern starts. Now let's imagine here that I've got a coherent light source. A coherent light source essentially means that those phases we were talking about, all the photons of light that are coming from that light, light source start off in phase with all their phases pointing in the same direction. And as they point, uh, approach the gap, they will stay all synchronized, if you like, all in phase. Now, when it approaches this gap, because the gap is of a not too dissimilar width to the, the wavelength, diffraction is going to occur. And Huygens would tell you that each of these points along the wave here is going to act as a, a secondary wave source. We're not going to get into that. We're just going to look at this point here and this point here. So if the wave from this point here travels just straight on, then it's going to travel the same distance as this one's going to travel as it goes straight on. But if they move to maybe somewhere up here on the screen, you know, then both of these are going to travel different distances. Let me show you what I mean. So when this photon here is heading to this part of the screen, and this photon here is heading to that part of the screen, this one's going to have a shorter distance to travel. It's got a little bit of a head start. And we can say that the head start represents, or is represented, by this distance here. And we call that the path difference. Now, the size of that path difference is very important uh, in terms of telling us what's going to happen over here. So, for example, if the phases we talked about at this point are both up here, then if the path difference is a full wavelength, by the time this wave has arrived here, though this photon or phaser, sorry, has arrived here, it will have done a full 360 degrees, meaning that it's still in phase with this one. So when they hit the target over there, because from here the distance they've got to travel is the same, so when they hit the target over here, they are going to be in phase. They're going to be like the ones we saw at the beginning that are going to constructively interfere and cause a bright spot. But if this difference here is half a wavelength, but then by the time this phaser reaches here, it's going to be exactly in the opposite direction to this one. They're going to be what we call 90, uh, 180 degrees sorry, out of phase. And by the time they hit the screen over here, they're going to destructively interfere like we saw before. Now we can go a little bit deeper. Now we can go a little bit deeper. And in schools, what we tend to do is fire a laser beam uh, through a slit and we use it to calculate the, the wavelength of the light. Um, the wavelength of the light, I'm going to call lambda. And we use the equation n lambda equals d sine theta. And this is how we figure it out. So how do I calculate exactly what this distance is? Well, I can treat this as a right angle triangle. And this angle here, I'm going to call theta. And the, the gap here, the distance between the slit, I'm just going to call d. And using trigonometry, or using sine, we know that the opposite, which is what the path difference is, is going to be the hypotenuse, which is d, times the sine of theta. So that gives us d sine theta. Just going to pull that into uh, focus for you. Now, why is d sine theta important? Well, let's say we get our first bright spot here. This is where they've just travelled straight on. Well, next to that, we're going to get our first, or our next, sorry, little bright fringe, where they have had to travel at a certain angle. But we know that when they travel and form this bright fringe here, that the path difference has to be equal to one full wavelength, one 360 degree rotation of that phaser. So at that point, we can say that the wavelength of the light equals d sine theta. Now, on the diagram I've just drawn, it might look like theta is quite a difficult or almost impossible angle to measure, but it's not. Um, that angle theta will also be identical to the angle between that, that central maximum peak and the first bright fringe next to it, which uh, in a practical setting is, is very easy to measure. Now, that's true for this fringe here. There are more bright fringes as we go on, and we can simply change that equation to n lambda equals d sine theta. If we treat that as the second bright fringe from the centre, then this n will become a 2. So to boil it down, basically, diffraction is when a wave 
passes through a gap or uh, next to the edge of an object and it spreads out. And when it spreads out, the, uh, the waves can interfere with each other, superposition takes place, and we can get these diffraction patterns. Now, if a diffraction pattern from one object happens to lie next to the diffraction pattern of another object, so if I'm looking at, at two things in the distance, both of them are going to cause a diffraction pattern on my eye because they're going through the aperture, uh, which is my pupil. Now, it'll be a slightly different shape because my pupil's um, a circle and not a, not a slit, but still, they're going to form diffraction patterns on my, my retina. If the, the first minima of one diffraction pattern is right underneath the principal peak, you know, the, the brightest central peak of another diffraction pattern, then that's as close as those objects can be before I can't resolve them into two objects, because before I, I can't tell them apart anymore. Um, there is a video on that on this channel. It's called the Rayleigh Criterion. It literally has nothing to do with things disappearing from the bottom up. It's all just about resolving two objects. Nothing to do with, you know, half a boat vanishing um, as, as the flat earth as Nathan Oakley would like to tell you. Um, so I will urge you to have a look at the Rayleigh Criterion video on my channel as well. But there are better videos, to be honest, out there if you want to search that yourself. This has been quite boring, but, um, you know, Nathan Oakley, I hope you've been watching. I hope you've been learning something. Um, see you later.